Okay, we might as well begin. Uh, it's kind of cloudy outside yet. It's supposed to clear up later on, so we'll, we'll see uh, what we'll be able to see. Um, the big, one of the big topics tonight for us to talk about is the comet. That's um, not all that bright right now, but it's, it's uh, important that you know facts about comets, how they work, and what they're there for. We are the Hartford County Astronomical Society, and like it says here, we're here for you. We're here once a month, right around the first quarter moon, so that the moon isn't too bright, so that we can't see other things. And uh, our next open house will be, I believe, on February 25th. Usually it's every four weeks um, in, be in between visits. Okay, here is, at least I hope you got a chance to see the moon tonight, but this is our moon tonight. It's the first first quarter moon, right, <laughs> right here. This is the first quarter moon. It's halfway to the full moon. It's a seven-day-old moon, so it's, it's cut exactly right in half. And on the other side, we're seven days from the full moon, and on the other side, seven days after the full moon, is the last quarter moon. So it's this side and this side. Here, it's a waxing moon. It's growing bigger, and the sun is in the west. So that's why this end of the moon is lit up. But after the full moon, the eastern part of the moon is lit up here because the sun is in the east. And then it's a waning moon. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller. If you want to see a crescent waning moon, you have to get up early in the morning. Just before the sun rises, this, this will be a crescent and it'll set in the east. So that's our moon tonight. Okay. Um, I'm starting off with this because our last presentation, we were at the 4-H club at Rock State Park. We had a zillion people there. And one young man came up to me and said, what's a white hole? And I looked at him and I went, wow, I haven't heard that in about 10 or 15 years. It's theory. It's, it's all theory, but I figured, well, hey, it's my duty to answer this question, whether this, that young man is here or not. It was my resp I feel like I should answer the question. And these are good things to know, okay? So a black hole. A black hole, we all know what a black hole is. When a big giant star finally ends its life, it contracts and it blows out its outer layers. And if it's heavy enough, it either becomes a neutron star or a black hole. And a black hole is so dense, it's so heavy, that even light can't escape. We all learned that in school. And that's what, but it's black and it's, it's hard to see through a telescope. You can't see it. You have to see what's swirling in around it. So here's the black hole. That's the only thing we know that's true right now. Everything else I tell you from here on in is theory. It hasn't been explored yet. But this is what they think a white, a white hole is, the other end of a black hole. If you went into a black hole, maybe you could come out the other end and it would be a white hole. So nothing can escape from a black hole, but nothing can get in to a white hole. A white hole, a white hole just spits, spits things out, okay? And then there's also, the, people talk about wormholes. This is, this is a real exaggeration, where you can go into a black hole, go through a wormhole, and come out a white hole someplace else. And this is what the big thing about a wormhole is that, well, let me tell you this first. The universe, there's no center of the universe. People say, well, where's the middle of the universe? Well, there is none. Well, how can that be? Because the universe is like this ball, okay? It's like, or it's like a balloon when you're blowing it up. The balloon gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and if you put dots on the balloon, they get farther and farther apart. And that's what our universe is doing, okay? It's our, it, but there's really no center. There's no real center to this because this is all... This is all flat. But a wormhole, what they talk about wormhole is, if this is the part of the, a part of the universe, and you were up here, and you wanted to take your spaceship down here, so you'd have to go all the way around here to get to the point where you wanted to get. But a wormhole will cut right through a shortcut. A wormhole's a shortcut. It'll cut right through the book, and instead of going like this, You'll go straight down in here, save yourself a lot of time. But that's, those are the things that people talk about, black holes and white holes and wormholes and, um, and, and things like that. But 
none of that has been proven yet. There's just things that you hear about in the literature. Here again is another view of like a white hole. A black hole you would go in and a white hole you, you would come back out. But I don't think you could really survive going into a black hole. It's just the environment just isn't right for you to just slip in and slip out. You'd be stretched out like a piece of spaghetti once you get into a black hole. And now you don't want, you don't want to live like that. So anyway, okay, let's talk about comets. Since there is a comet uh, pretty close to the sun and the earth right now, and it's, but the last, one of the big famous comets that was here last was back in 1986. It was Halley's Comet, or Halley's Comet, however you want to say it. It wasn't the brightest comet that we've seen. In the past, it's been very bright, but this is a, it's called a periodic uh, comet. Here's, we saw it in 1986. So in 2024, it's way out here past Neptune's orbit. So it comes around, goes out, comes back, comes out, comes back. And I think it'll come back, what, in every 76 years. That, that was it for me. I'm not going to see it again. <laughs> um, well, maybe, but I doubt it. Um, but anyway, it's, it'll come back into early uh, 20, 2061 or 2062. So if you can hang on, you'll see it again. It'll swing back. It'll swing back over here and come around the sun and come close to us. That's one of the comets that we've seen in the past. And, and here's kind of what it looks like when it comes by Earth. This is a little bit of an exaggeration, but if you're standing on Earth, some of these comets are really, really bright. And the tails you can really, really see, not only at night, but sometimes during the day. Now here's how it works. A comet will come in. Here's the tail of the comet. This is the sun. Here's the tail of the comet. But the tail of the comet always points away from the sun. Why? Because the sun is shooting off energy and particles. It's like a solar wind, but you can't feel it. But the comet can. And it's blowing the dust and the ions away from it. So the sun is blowing things out this way, and the comet, the tail, always ends up in the back. Okay. Here's Comet Hale-Bopp. This was a good one back in 1996. Um, it was nice and bright. It was right up in the sky in the evening. Uh, I mean, it wasn't too bright, but it was there, and it had, it had two tails. We'll talk about the two tails later, but this was a, a really nice Comet Hale-Bopp in 1996. And if you discover a comet or an asteroid, uh, I'm not sure about asteroids, but a comet, they'll name it after you. So these two gentlemen saw it about the same time, and they named the comet after them. So that's one, one way to hit the history books. Um, see, here's another one, McNaught in 2007. That's probably, I think, what it really looked like, but in the southern hemisphere. Uh, it depends where you are. Here's another one, a comet's tail at sunset. Now here's a comet. Shoemaker-Levy. Mr. Shoemaker and Mr. Levy discovered this in the mid-90s, and it went around the sun, but then it started, it's, it, got, it started going towards Jupiter, and then it started breaking up. Why did it break up? Because Jupiter is so big, and it has s such heavy gravity that it disrupted the comet. A comet is not as solid as an asteroid. An asteroid is rock, rock and iron. Very, it's, it's heavy. It's like a meteorite. It's, it's very, very heavy, but a comet is loose. Another name for a comet is a dirty snowball. <laughs> and that's what it is. You go outside in the springtime when it's warm and it's all muddy and you make a snowball, half of it is mud. And that's really what a comet is. It's very loosely packed. So what happened to the comet? It started breaking up. It started breaking up. Because, it, like I said, it's very loose. And it crashed into Jupiter, one piece at a time. And you could see these dark spots here, 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 here. As Jupiter spun on its axis, rotated, these, these pieces of comet crashed into it. And Jupiter and Saturn, they rotate pretty quickly. Uh, I think it's only like a 12 hours. They, go, they, uh, they rotate. Their day is 12 hours, not like ours is 24. So that's why there's, you can see the separation 
of the comet uh, when it hit Jupiter. So here's our comet tonight. We're hoping that you guys will be able to see it sort of in the northern part of the sky, right around the Little Dipper, I believe, right, right around the Little Dipper, maybe a little bit south. But, I mean, it's not going to be bright and go, oh, my gosh, look at that. It's, you know, <laughs> you got to realize what you're looking at. But you might look like something like this with a powerful telescope. And you can see it. It's usually green. We'll explain that later. But this is, and it's called C2022E3ZTF. Uh, that's kind of a long name because it just was recently discovered. There's another slide of it. And another, but you might you might catch it looking like this, as it as it gets brighter. Uh, when was it? January. At the end of uh, at the end of January, it was closest to the sun. It was uh, perihelion. Okay, helion helos refers to the sun. It was perihelion, but now it's going to be um, uh, close closest to the Earth. Early next week, February 1st, February 2nd, it'll be closest to Earth. So we're hoping that it's still bright enough for us to see. Maybe it'll look something like that, maybe even a little bit brighter. But now here's what a comet is all about. A comet has a nucleus, okay? It's hard. It's, it's the hardest part of a comet. But then it has the outer part, the coma, right here. And that's the green that you see. When you look at a comet through a telescope, you see a greenish color, and that's, uh, and that's here. That's the coma. This is when the ultraviolet rays of the sun are hitting carbon atoms, C2. There's two carbon atoms linked together, and they fluoresce when uh, the sun's energy hits them, and they fluoresce uh, with the color green uh, because that's what, what carbon would be. So this part of it here is green. Now you have the dust tail. You can see that really clearly because it's just dust. And it's reflecting off the sun, like tiny little mirrors reflecting off the sun. Okay, And now the ion tail here, it's blue. It's bluish. It's harder to see. But it's carbon monoxide, CO, carbon monoxide. And when the sun's rays hit carbon monoxide, it shines in the bluish part of the spectrum. So this ion tail here is blue. Not every comet, you can see both of these. Uh, this one sometimes is too dim. But if you're going to see anything, you're going to see the dust tail. Okay? And of course, the wind's blowing this way, the solar wind, so the tail is out, is out that way. So that's kind of how that, all that works. Now. We just talked about that. I had another slide. Um, here's I guess not. It must be later on. Okay. Um, here's, here's our solar system. Okay, here's Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and here's Jupiter. Now, between Mars and Jupiter, there are all these asteroids, the asteroid belt. Okay, there's plenty of those. And even over here, there's asteroids, the Trojans and the Greeks, you know, they, have, they name them. But they're everywhere. They're everywhere. When our solar system was first forming, Jupiter and um, Saturn were a lot closer to the sun. They kept, they're, they're, they kept shifting their orbits. They were, really, they were really close to the sun, closer than Mars. And then they shifted back outward. But the, the, between Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, their gravity, they have so much gravity that they started tossing everything out. Get out of my way. They wanted all the asteroids to get out. They wanted to clear their orbit. They just wanted to be there by themselves. So, okay, so here, here's a group, here's a group of asteroids that didn't quite make it out. It, who knows, it might have even been another planet that something happened to, okay? But now, let's, let's, go, let's go a step further. Now we're, go, we're working our way out, okay? Here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and that's the way you say it, Uranus, <laughs> okay, Uranus, and Neptune, okay? And now, whoa, what happened? Pluto's 
not a planet anymore. So the planets are over here. Pluto is here. Okay, here's Ceres, um, Eris, dwarf planets, planets. Past Neptune. Okay, here's, here's Neptune. There's a place called the Kuiper Belt. And it's loaded. It's loaded with asteroids and comets. That's where all the big planets threw all the junk from the solar system out because their, their, their gravity caused that. And out here is the Kuiper Belt. There's billions of asteroids and comets. This is where Pluto comes in. Pluto belongs out here, but it happens to be the closest Kuiper Belt object to our solar system. And our solar system's planets go like this around the sun, don't they? But not Pluto. Pluto kind of goes like this. Okay, it has a different orbit, just like all the Kuiper Belt objects. So Pluto, they call Jupiter the king of the planets because it's the biggest. Um, a thousand Earths could fit inside Jupiter. It's a, it's a big. But Pluto, don't feel bad for Pluto because you can call Pluto the king of the dwarf planets because so far it's the biggest. Of course, it's hard to see way out here. Our telescopes can't do a really good job seeing way out here. That's why we have the Hubble Space Telescope and now the James Webb Telescope that can see a lot farther because their optics are better. And they look at different wavelengths. And we'll talk about wavelengths later. But this, like I said, there's billions of other objects out there. Isn't that enough? No. Because past the Kuiper Belt, there's the Oort cloud. And it has billions and trillions of more asteroids and mostly comets. So there's so many out here. But see, here's a, here's a comet, here's a comet. If two of these, if two objects get close together, their gravities can sort of send them in a different direction. And a lot of times things out here happen, uh, an object might come close even to the Oort cloud, something that we can't see, and it shakes up the Oort cloud or the Kuiper belt and sends something inside our solar system. That's why we have to keep watching out for asteroids and comets, because any time any one of these could start heading in, depending on what's outside of our solar system and, and the Oort cloud. Now, uh, I said that our, our comets are non-periodic. Uh, th this comet that we're going to see tonight is non-periodic. The comets you saw photos there are periodic. Periodic comets means they always come back. Sooner or later, they come back. It could be, but it's usually less than 200 years. If they come back once every 200 years, it's a periodic comet. If it takes longer than that, it's a non-periodic comet. Sometimes comets just come through once, and that's it. They're gone forever. They're just passing through. Uh, but others are way out here, and they still circle the sun. All right, let's talk about... Um, I, want, I wanted to go... I wanted to talk about different things, not just stars and nebula and, and constellations. Uh, we can talk about those any time, but there's other things that you need to know. And we're here not only to show you photographs of what's out there and what you can see with your telescopes and binoculars, but we want you to learn stuff here too about what's going on with the sun and with the universe. So this is the whole spectrum of, of this electromagnetic spectrum. All the light, whether you can see it or not, this is what's here. You have radio waves, you have infrared rays, waves, visible light. Here's the visible light. This is what we can see with our eyes because that's all we need to see. Our sun is yellow white. And because our sun is yellow white, the best color that we can see of all these colors is right in the middle, yellow green. At night, everything turns gray. And these are the last two colors to turn gray because those are the strongest for our eyes to see. Okay, here's red and it goes all, these are rainbow, that's our rainbow. It's a rainbow. It goes from red to purple. After that, it's ultraviolet getting, and then x-rays and then gamma rays. These are the most dangerous and these are the least dangerous. Okay, I want you to see that. And here again, 
When I say wavelength, this is a wavelength. See how, how short the wavelength is here and how long it is here. So these are, these are not as harmful as these are over here. Gamma rays are, gamma ray, uh, cosmic rays, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet rays are dangerous waves. I mean, the others are dangerous too, but not quite as dangerous. I, want you to, I just want you to see that. Now here's what, what we use them for, radio waves to broadcast radio and television. Okay, microwaves, we know that. We put our food in there all the time. You don't want to stick your head in there, of course, <laughs> because that wouldn't be good. Then you'd see, oh, oh that guy was right. These are dangerous. Um, and here, this is infrared. Infrared transfers heat. And um, here's the spectrum again. Here's our visible spectrum. Here's uh, ultraviolet. This is where you get your sunburn, ultraviolet rays. That's why you have to wear your sunglasses, protect your eyes. You stay in the sun too long, you get all red. Okay, so you know they're dangerous. And then x-rays, you go to the dentist, you go to the dentist say, oh, we got to take x-rays of your teeth. And you're sitting there going, again? You do this all the time. But when you listen, they put that thing here, and it goes, eh. Okay, it doesn't last very long because you don't want too many x-rays in your body. Because see, they only, the only, the only x-ray a little bit at a time. And then there's uh, gamma rays. Gamma rays are used in um, uh, cancer cells, I believe. I, I read that. And uh, they are used, but uh, it's no harm to the people who are getting them. But these are more dangerous, and you can see how the wavelengths are sm smaller. That makes them more dangerous. Okay. And we have uh, spaceships out in space. Not only we have the Hubble, Hubble out there, that Hubble looks mostly in the visible spectrum and a little bit in the infrared. Um, the uh, James Webb Telescope looks uh, visible infrared and way into the infrared and a little bit into the ultraviolet. So we can see a lot more detail with the James Webb Telescope. Okay, and. Uh, uh, gamma rays are measured by SWIFT, RTXE. Here's Hubble, J WMAP uh, is a microwave uh, telescope out there. And the radio waves, these are, these are the radio waves here, which are measured by these big plates that they put out um, in the desert, I think. Oh, before we get there, here's the sun that's imaged in a different wavelengths. Here's the visible, but here's infrared, microwave, radio waves. See, and, and Telescopes, they get all this information and they put it together and they give you a nice photo that you look in a magazine and see, wow, this is really cool. But it's a combination of all these wavelengths and they're, they're, being, and they're being used out circling the Earth. Here's another one, uh, just the same thing again. But you see how the radio waves, the wavelength is short and here they're, they're long. But you don't see much in X-rays, okay? You don't see much in X-rays or even gamma rays because our sun doesn't give out a lot of gamma rays. You want to get a good gamma ray, you have two neutron, neutron stars colliding or um, a star entering a black hole and you, you'll get some gamma rays. But they are extremely dangerous. Here's two, here's two images. Um, by the way, these are um, nebula. Nothing but gas and dust. This is nothing but gas and dust and it's reflecting light from the stars. Just out of, I, didn't, I don't have any nebula to guess the names with tonight because this is a special presentation. What does that look like to you? If you were gonna name this, what does that look like to you? Living in Maryland? Well, that was, that was a pretty good hint. Um, what was, what's that other hint I could give you? Uh, What's, what's one of our mascots in Maryland? There it is. Does that look like a turtle to you? No. Oh, my goodness. What is he saying? Here's the head, and here's the, sh the shell right here. Okay. And you, you, when you look at these nebulae, you've got to use your imagination now. You can't. It's not going to look like a real, you know. But, it's, but here, if you look at it here with, uh, I think this is, uh, this is infrared, you see a different image. Of this, this is the same image, but it's taken with a different, a different wavelength. So here, 
You see all that dust and gas, and you say, wow, that's hard to see. But look how many stars you can see here. Because infrared light goes through all that dust, all that junk in our atmosphere, and it can see past all the dirt and all the, um, all the dust that's out in space, and it can look at the stars. That's why that's so valuable, the infrared spectrum. And that's what the James Webb Telescope is doing. Here's another, here's a galaxy. Here's our galaxy. But look at the different views you get with the different wavelengths. Okay, here, x-rays, right here. What's in the center of this galaxy? A black hole. Just about every galaxy has a black hole in its center. Ours does too. It weighs about 3 million, has the mass of about 3 million suns. It's very dense. But it doesn't give away all the light. It just gives off x-ray light. Okay, so that gives you an idea of that. Here's, a, here's just another one. It's different, different views. See, here's um, uh, the Eagle Nebula. But here is, look at how, much, how many more stars you can see with the infrared. Because it passes through all that uh, gas and dust. And the same thing here. And x-rays, nothing. Because there's nothing to see with x-rays. But you need them. Now here's the radio telescopes. This is what the radio telescopes. They're dishes. And they make a... They, put them, they all work together. They're all talking to each other and they work together. SETI, search for extraterrestrial life. If somebody gets a radio signal from another alien civilization, this is how they're going to detect it with the radio waves, radio telescopes. Because radio waves can go through everything. Okay? So they're, they're, these are in the deserts. This one, I believe, is in uh, western United States. But they have them in Chile, any place where there's, it's flat and they can get a good view of the sky. You'll see a, a radio telescope. And here's a microwave. This is, this is a microwave shot of the early universe. This, the red, this is temperature fluctuations from when the Earth, this was 370,000 years after the Big Bang. Not very long. This is when light first came into being. There were the dark ages because the universe was so hot that the photons were trapped. They couldn't, they couldn't get out. But once the universe cooled down to about, I don't know, this may be um, uh, six or seven um, thousand degrees Fahrenheit or something like that, but it was cool enough for electrons and protons to become atoms, and it freed the photons. And this is what the early universe looked like. The red is warmer and the blue is cooler. And they, they, people thought that, well, if the universe is so uniform, everything should be the same. Well, it's not. There's higher densities and there are lower densities of matter. And that's what causes these cool spots and, and, the, and the hot spots. But that gives you some idea of what these things are used for. Now they just discovered this um, Arendelle, uh, which is one of the first stars in the universe that was formed. Okay, we saw that uh, 370,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, light came into being, and the first stars showed up about maybe um, less than 1 billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, 200 million, 300 million, 400 million, the first stars, and then the first galaxies shortly after that. Well, this is one of the first, uh, first stars that, uh, that they saw recently, and that's kind of where it is. Uh, Hubble saw it, and it's right in here. Right in here, it's right there. But it's far away. You say, well, how can we see a star that's so far away? What happens is there's this trick in, in nature that if something, say your star is really far away and there's a big galaxy in front of it, what happens is the light from the star goes around the galaxy or whatever's in front of it, and the galaxy multiplies that life, that light. So this star has a bunch of uh, stars and galaxies in front of it, and it, it amplified the light of that star 40,000 times so that it was visible, even though it was, it was um, less than um, a billion years after the Big Bang. But you know where this star is now? It's 28 billion miles away because the universe is expanding. 
It's getting bigger. There's dark energy out there. We won't talk about that tonight. But the universe is expanding. Everybody thought that the universe has enough matter so when the Big Bang went like this and all the matter scattered, it would stop because of gravity and then come back on itself and it would end up in a big crunch. Everything would start over again. But there's a force out there called dark energy that's pulling everything out. And right now, the, the, the thing is that the universe will not contract. It'll just keep going till everything cools off and everything is gone. Trillions and trillions of years from now. So um, it's in uh, Cetus the Whale. Uh, that star is in Cetus the Whale. That star is here somewhere in Cetus the Whale. But there's another star here called Myra. Mira, Myra. Okay, here's the whale. Okay, here's and here's and here's Myra. Let's show you. Let me show you. Here's the whale. Can you? This is how they named it. Here's the tail, and the head. The whale. You know, they really use your imagination. That looks like a whale to me. Okay. Um, so uh, that's the way all the constellations are. They're really funny how they look. Um, but here it is. What it looks like. And number six would be Mira. Here's Mira. Mira is a, is, a red, uh, is a red giant. It's a variable star. It brightens, it dims, it brightens, it dims. And it's about it's maybe three or four hundred light years away. A light year is 5.8 trillion miles. 5.8 trillion miles is how far light can travel in one year at 186,000 miles per second. Okay, something like that. So here's Myra. And Myra is a double, a double star. It has, a, it has another star that's along with it, and it's a white dwarf. Okay, after our sun gets to be a red giant, it's going to blow off its outer layers, and it's going to become a white dwarf. Very small, the size of the Earth, but very dense. So Myra has a second, has a second companion. Here is the whale down here. And here's Andromeda. We've talked about Andromeda and uh, Pegasus, Andromeda, Orion. It's not far from Orion, uh, heading south. Okay. So now here's another star I wanted. I never, I never showed these slides before. This is the first time. I never talked about this constellation before. The southern, the southern fish. It's way in the southern sky in the fall. You have to see it. But Fomalhaut is a very bright star. It's a big, blue, white giant. Okay, and here it is. And this is a fish. Okay, that's a fish, and that's, and that's Fomalhaut. And, oh, let me tell you something else about Myra. Mira, Mira, Myra. Ben-Hur, who, who watched Ben? Who's seen the movie Ben-Hur? Okay, so Ben-Hur, he's traveling around, and he meets the sheik. Okay. Sheik has many wives, and, but the sheik has four white horses. Remember the four white horses? They all have names of stars, very bright stars, okay? But the mother of the four white horses, which he, they say it in the movie, was Mira. Mira was the mother of the four white horses. Next time you see Ben-Hur, maybe around Easter time, uh, watch it and pay attention. Pay attention when they're talking about the horses, what their names are, and the mother of, of the four horses, and those four horses won the big chariot race at the end, so they're, they're heroes, they're big hero, hero horses. But uh, here's, um, uh, here's uh, the uh, Pisces Austrinus, okay? And it's not far from uh, Pisces and Pegasus, uh, but it's in the south. It's a very bright star in the south. And here it is. It's a triple star system. Most of the stars in the sky are at least two stars. Our star is by itself. But our star had a family. Our sun, when it first formed, had a family. It had many, many stars. It wasn't alone. But those stars drifted away. So now our sun is by itself. But most of the stars in the sky are doubles, triples, okay? And most of them are also red. Red is the dominant color. Red dwarfs are the dominant color of the stars in the sky. But here is a, a unique star system. It's got a big dust um, ring around it. And the dust is held in place by two stars. Two stars, they keep, 
they keep the rings intact. The same thing happens on Saturn. Some of the outer rings stay there because there's moons that keep it. They're watching over the, uh, the ring to keep it from uh, drifting away. But this is uh, the Fomalhaut star system. Uh, one star is about a light year away and the other star is about two and a half light years away. So it's a triple, triple star system. And here it is. Um, and it also might have a planet. So it also, it also uh, might have a planet. So um, as J James Webb Telescope gets going, we'll, we'll see what we can find out about this star. Now, here's, here's two things that I was really interested in when I was in school. They said, I want everybody in the class to give a talk about something. And I'm there, oh man, another talk. Two things I was really interested in. One was plate tectonics, the drifting of the continents, how they were all one big continent and they're drifting apart. And again, they're going to come together again. Okay. And the other one was hydrothermal vents under the sea. I'm going to give you a little bit of, of each one of these. This is what the earth looked like 94 million years ago. Okay. Look at how South America and Africa used to be connected. When these were all together, these, uh, South America and Africa were connected. Now they're drifting apart. But look at what's cool here. Look at California. California wasn't even attached to, to, uh, um, uh, to America. It was going this way. It just attached recently. And in the future, it's going to go this way. It's going to go north in another 94 million years from today. So things are happening. That's why there's so much... Um, the, the, the plates are rubbing together in California here, and that's why there's so much activity uh, in California, earthquakes, volcanoes, and things like that. But these are, are going this way. And even Antarctica, look at Australia was once attached to Antarctica, and they're all going south. But that's why the weather on the Earth was always different. Sometimes the weather on the whole planet was mild. And that's when the dinosaurs were here. It was nice and warm, a lot of oxygen, lots of food. The dinosaurs grew really big because the conditions were right. So now, this is where we are today. And here's where the continents are separating. Here's where they're coming together. But we're going to concentrate on one part right now. This is really cool. Right here, off the Galapagos Islands, there is a place where there is a fissure a mile and a half down under the sea, there is a hole, okay? It's where, it's where two shelves separated. And water is going, uh, the mantle, lava is coming up, but also the water is going in, and the water is coming up. This is really neat. This is, these are tube worms, okay? Uh, Raftia pactatilla, uh, genus and species name. These are tube worms. These tube worms live about a mile and a half down, and it's dark. There's no light, and there's very, very, very little oxygen. Okay? But these, two, these tube worms are happy. They're living down there. There's crabs there. Uh, there's uh, um, clams, crabs. Crabs have no eyes because it's dark. They don't need eyes. But they're, li they're all white, and they're all living down here. But they're, but they're not living on oxygen the way we live on oxygen, okay? But those are, those are tube worms. Here's another. I think this slide is so cool. It's so pretty. But that's what it, there's a, there's a uh, submarine down there that's shining its light on these. So, but that's the way they look, okay? And they're living down there. And the pressure, the temperature, so the water that comes out off the cracks of the earth, some, sometimes it's about almost, almost 500 degrees... Fahrenheit, okay, but it doesn't, it, but it doesn't bubble away. Why doesn't it bubble away? Why is it still just hot water and not gas? Because of the pressure. When you're a mile and a half down, you got a mile and a half of water sitting up on top of you, and all that pressure is pushing things together, so the water doesn't boil. But these plants and animals are happy down there. It's strange, isn't it, how something like that can happen? This is how they live. Here's the tube worm. This is how they get their um, food, oxygen, from here. Okay, whatever's in the water they need, they get it through here, and it passes down their body. But down here, 
There's bacteria that live. We talked about the last few sessions that if there's life discovered on another planet, it's probably going to be in form of a bacteria, like blue-green algae, which were the first things that came up on Earth. About a billion years after the Earth was formed, okay, the first things that came were, were plant-based and they were blue-green algae. That was life, one-celled animals. Well, these bacteria, they live down here. And the worms supply food for the bacteria, and the bacteria provide oxygen for the worm. It's called symbiosis. They live together. One animal helps the other. Okay, that's the only way they can survive down there. And this is, all right, this is, this is, I won't get any more complicated than this, but this is photosynthesis. This is what happens in leaves, plant leaves. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We breathe in oxygen, okay? The plants, they like carbon dioxide, so they take in the carbon dioxide and they expel oxygen. We take in the oxygen and we expel the carbon dioxide. So we're living with the plants. That's why it's very important that we don't get rid of all our trees and plants. The plants use carbon dioxide water and they make sugar, carbon, uh, carbohydrates, which we're not supposed to eat. So, um, and oxygen. Okay, that's, this is photosynthesis. This happens in the leaves. But what happens under the ocean? There's no oxygen down there. So they have carbon dioxide water, and they use hydrogen sulfide instead of oxygen. And they make sugar for the worm, and they give off hydrogen sulfide gas. Sugar, sugar, we get sugar, and they get sugar for them to live. This is, this is photosynthesis, this is chemosynthesis. This is how plants and animals live in the dark without oxygen. Okay, I just wanted to hit you with that. So here they are again. They're pretty looking. Here's a hole in the top where they come out and uh, water goes in. So um, it's a very hospitable um, um, environment. But that's what could happen on another planet. Okay, we want to send a spacecraft to Europa. Jupiter's moons, Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede all probably have oceans under their surface. They're very interested in Europa. And I think in two or three years, one of, I don't know if it's China or one of the countries is going to send a probe to Europa. I wish they'd hurry up because I'm running out of time. <laughs> and and I, yeah, I want answers to these questions and I don't want to wait, you know what I mean? But they've seen plumes of water coming out cracks in Europa's surface. And that's water that's from the ocean underneath. So if those, those animals can live in a, such a terrible environment on Earth, anything could live on another planet. We keep, on th keep up thinking of aliens landing on Earth. You know, people that look like us, or people with two heads or, or whatever, like you see on um, Star Trek or all those other space shows. But, you know, unless a spaceship lands in my backyard and an alien comes out and shakes my hand and says hello, no, no. That's, I'm, not, I'm not believing in that just yet. And right now, no other life has been found anywhere besides Earth. Okay? Um, just in case you're curious, um, about four and a half billion years ago, there was another planet with the same orbit as Earth. They called it Ga Ga Gaia, G-A-I-A. Okay? It was about the size of Mars. Eventually, it crashed into Earth. And that's how our moon formed. And... After that, about, uh, about maybe a half a billion or billion years later, remember I told you that Jupiter and Saturn and the big planets were shifting their orbits. And all that stuff came flying also in. A lot of it went out, but there was a period of heavy bombardment on Earth and the Moon. And this is when the Earth was still forming. It was volcanoes everywhere but it was, it was being bombarded. And that's why our moon is so important. It protects us against a lot of asteroids that could collide on Earth. And Jupiter protects us also. And this is what it, what it looked like on Earth. The moon was a lot closer to Earth. The moon's moving away from Earth about this much every year. It's going away. Uh, but that's what it would look like on Earth uh, way back then. Not a great place to 
to live. Okay, that was that's the end of that's the end of my presentation. So I hope you learned uh, something today. Not only you know just about the stars and constellations. Uh, the last two presentations I gave, we we did a lot of constellations and stars, and we'll do it again. We'll do the winter constellations again since it's still winter. By the way, the full moon, January's full moon. What's the name of our full moon in January? The what moon? It's an animal. What moon? The wolf moon, you're absolutely correct. Hey, good job. It's the wolf moon. Because this time of the year, the wolves are out looking for food. So they called it, they named it the wolf moon. All right, thank you for sitting in. I hope it's nice and clear outside. Look at everybody's telescope and see if you can see the comet. Thank you.